show. This is Palace Confidential, the weekly Mail Plus show featuring news, debate and analysis from the Mail's royal team and some outside friends. And today we have the Daily Mail's editor-at-large, Richard Kay, diarist Richard Eden and former Royal Protection Officer Ken Wharf. And here's what you have to look forward to today. We'll be hearing the incredible tale of the hero who saved Princess Anne in 1974 from the clutches of an armed robber. And Meghan touched back down in the UK last night, but the big question is, who will be paying for her and Harry's security when they go back to Canada? Plus, we asked the public the all-important questions, of course, like, do they think William went too far when joking about coronavirus? But first to the incredible tale of the hero who saved a young Princess Anne from being kidnapped in 1974. This week, Ronnie Russell reluctantly sold the decoration he was awarded as he needs the money in his old age. The former heavyweight boxer received a bravery medal for his actions over 40 years ago. He told us how the fateful day unfolded. As I turned into the mall, I saw the royal car coming down the mall. Go back, when I get back, he's now got all the windows smashed in. A gun on the floor, another gun in his hand. Princess Anne by the arm and there's a tug of war going on. And he's going, come on Anne, you've got to come. You know you've got to come. I, I decided that uh, I'm here now and, and it's, I'm going to stop it. One way or another, I'm going to stop what's going on. And I said, I had my bit with Princess Anne, held her out of the car and braced myself because I was expecting to be shot in the back. And I thought, it, maybe it won't hurt so much in the back. My back's harder. So it might hurt so much. That's the, that's the bit that sticks to, in my mind the most, hitting him, because I hit him very, very hard. And had it been a tree, it would have gone down as well. It'd still be a tree less now in Pall Mall. I, I am a royalist, through and through royalist. Um, I got involved believing that a member of the royal family is more valuable than my own life. Um, I was quite happy to lay down my life to save her life. Princess Anne, she never once looked miffed or panicked. She just stayed there saying, go away, you silly man. When I got notification that I was going to be awarded the George Medal, um, I was very, very proud and very on. I never, ever, at any stage of it, believed that there was going to be any form of payment for it. There was going to be no money. It wasn't like I've, I've done a normal job as a as a minder or something like that, and then it's someone. It was just purely, I'd done what I'd done. And uh, yes, I was honoured, and I'm still honoured. I got a friend there, a Bentley, I borrowed his Bentley to go in. And uh, it, it, it was, obviously it was very surreal, going into Buckingham Palace. I'd never been in Buckingham Palace before. When I went forward to receive the medal from the Queen, as you lean forward, the Queen comes from the throne to the front of the steps, and then she pins the medal on. And as she pinned the medal on, she went, this medal thanks you as the Queen. But I want to thank you as Anne's mother. So that was quite touchy for me. And then we went to a private reception after that, where it was Princess Anne and other members of the royal family there. Princess Anne spent more time talking to my children than to anybody else, really. She made quite a fuss of them. In summary, about royal security is there wasn't enough at the time. It has brought about massive changes in what happens and that can only be for the good and it's easy witness now you see anybody going to the palace to see the queen i've got security around them all the way down all the way in and when they go back taking them all the way back it was needed it obviously is costly but it's a cost we need it's a cost you can't live without because it needs protection there are people there are nutcases out there well, at auction this week, it sold for a whopping £50,000, and that was more than double its estimate. Ken, I'm coming to you first. Ronnie did show, I think, almost superhuman bravery that day. Is that your view? Well, it did. I mean, I, it's incredible to believe that it was 40 years ago. Um, and for me, it, it was a turning point in sort of royal protection, because in 1974, um, there was effectively no protection, very on an ad hoc basis. I mean, that's so hard to believe now, isn't it? It's well, it is, but I mean, thankfully, I, mean, I think it sort of set an example of how important, you know, protection was. Because in those particular days, I mean, there was no special escort group. Um, policemen were sent down from the local police station to wipe their arms around, to send the roars off to wherever they were going. But, you know, Jim Beaton, who um, actually was a colleague of mine in Rorty Protection, um, he was very 
fortunate not to have lost his life on that yeah. occasion, having his own uh, firearm jammed at that point. But I think we, we shouldn't underestimate just how close to, to death Princess Anne was at that time, were it not for what we've just seen, Ronnie, and, and, and other people there. It could have been so much more disastrous. But for me, it was a real turning point. Like all um, events that happen to members of the royal family, there's always a review somewhere. But this was a major review that saw the formation of what then became A1 department, later become SO14 Royal Protection. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and the Yard seriously thought, well, this we cannot allow this minimal protection to, to, to continue. Which, in a way, um, sort of brings you right up to the present day, just how important you know, proper protection is and real protection based on real expertise. Yeah, but I, I'm fascinated by the mindset that you must have to have going into being a royal protection officer. I mean, Ronnie there saying he wasn't, he was, you know, a citizen and saying he would have laid down his life for royalty. Sure, does that go through your head? Did that, is that something that you accepted as part of the job? Well, I, I, I did. I mean, I always remember when working for the late night of Princess of Wales, she often said to me in a joke, I can't believe you'd actually lay your life down for me. I said, why, why do you say that? And of course I would. Oh, the point is, we, you would. I mean, in the circumstances presented itself, well, then you'd have to do what you were trained to do. I think in this particular case, I think had Jim Beaton's gun been working, um, maybe Ian Bull at that point would have you know, been in height of his life, and rightly so, because he was carrying a firearm. But, you know, that's the role that a protection officer will, will, will play. I mean, you, you, you run that risk, of course. Um, thankfully, it's never happened in, in the years that I was there and certainly thereafter because, you know, we rely upon the expertise of the training that raw protection officers receive to this day. Mm, yeah. Well, staying on the topic of security, the Duchess of Sussex arrived in the UK last night for her final duties as a senior royal. She landed in the middle of a row over who will foot the bill for the protection of her and Harry. So... Richard Kay, I'm coming to you. If Canada won't pay the bill, who will? I'm afraid it's going to be us, the British taxpayer. We'll, uh, have, to, we'll have to pick up the bill. And who, who gets the final say on that? Well, it's not something that members of the royal family per se have a, have a, a, a vote on, if you like. I mean, it's up to the British government of the day. I mean, there are uh, accepted protocols about protection of uh, vulnerable people and the Sussexes fit that profile. They have to be protected wherever they are. There are international accords on this. Mm. Um, we had hoped that, that Canada might stump up some of the money and, and, and share the cost with us, but um, Canadian citizens appear to be reluctant to spend out. So it's going to have to be the British taxpayer. Well, and speaking of the British taxpayer, Richard Eden, it's apparently going to cost something like about £20 million a year. What's think, your view? I think it's, it's very sad. I think it will cause outrage among many taxpayers if you know people here who earn, say, £15,000 a year are funding protection for a couple if they're travelling around America making millions. It would seem just, just wrong, I think. Mm. I mean, what about, does the royal family have any responsibility to dig deep? Well, I, I, I think we, we we're moving into sort of unprecedented waters here. Um, you know, I think nobody denies or, or doubts that Meghan, Harry and his, his newborn son deserve the best protection because even though they've effectively opted out of royal duties, they are still a, a vulnerable family, very much so. I mean, they're all iconic in their, in their own right. They are global celebrities. And uh, you know, the fact is, forget terrorism. Let's talk about kidnap of their young son. Let's talk about the fixated individuals that we know nothing about. But, Ken, don't you think that, that that's true of several high-profile, mega-famous people... No, I don't think it is true. ..who, I think who it, I aren't think, being funded by the taxpayer for their protection. Well, no, but I think this is a totally different... There's, there's no... As, as much as I don't know that many celebrities, but I do know that the celebrity status of being a senior prince of the realm and, and his wife and a son that, and the work that he has done up until now mm. makes him incredibly vulnerable. So there really is no real-time comparison. I think the problem here is... Is, and I agree with both Richards here, that, that the Yard has to continue, the government has to continue with this protection, irrespective of the, of the noises that's going to make, because there is no alternative. If you go into the private sector, then we have a real problem, because you're asking people that have perhaps never worked with such high-profile individuals, that, but equally um, would, would be denied access to government intelligence. And also, they would not be allowed to carry firearms. Mm. Now, you know, I'm not saying that everyone... But in their particular case, the carrying of firearms by professional people are now a necessity of modern-day life. At the question of funding it, what I do know is that, that when Beatrice and Uzani sort of 
lost their protection from the yard. The, the concerns came heavily from their father, Prince Andrew. And in the end, the, 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 Her Majesty the Queen actually funds that now. Now, could we be looking at going down, you know, the road of asking the Queen and indeed his father to make substantial mm. um, contributions to the funding and the payment of this security? That, to me, seems to be something that's never been discussed before, that could well be a way out for this. And tell me about what was your experience and what, what's your view of when Diana sort of, like, moved out of the, sort of, like, the, the protection of the royal um, security and, and was had private security. Is that well, something? Well, Richard could answer from a sort of a journalist point of view yeah. just how bad that was because, you know, Diana moved around London certainly without any protection. Soon after, she abandoned her protection. I remember it vividly that Diana literally, I came across her in a, in a muse in Belgravia who stopped. I wasn't expecting this and, you know, in tears saying, look behind me. And there were four paparazzi stalking her. So the problems are evident and without that protection you know that the, the, they are seriously at risk Diana knew that and ultimately in my view and I've spoken about this many times it was the lack of professional protection that actually in my view actually killed her in August in 1997. Do you agree with that Richard? Up to a point yes I mean Diana had a view that and it was slightly naive but it was her view I can tell you that that her fame was her protection she mm. felt that having dispensed with her Scotland Yard protection, which she did a long time before her death, um, she could manage her own security, if you like, that she, because she was such a famous person, no one was going to threaten her. It was, in my view, entirely naive. Mm. She never had security again after that until or unless she was carrying out engagements on behalf of the Queen overseas, for example, until that last ill-fated trip uh, with Mohammed al-Fayed's son, Dodi, um, to the south of France and beyond, and we all know what happened. It was not really Diana's protection. They were Dodie's bodyguards who were in the car with, with Diana and Dodie. Um, she made a conscious decision to dispense with her security. I agree with Ken. It ultimately led to her premature death. Mm. Was it difficult protecting Diana and the children? Well, no, it wasn't difficult. I mean, <laughs> it was actually... Because it sounds like it must well, have been incredibly stressful. Well, no, it was. I mean, the great thing about any protection um, scenario, particularly with Diana and the team that we had, was that, 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 that she acknowledged that protection was a necessary option. And for that reason, you know, acknowledged that and enabled me through the dialogue, through conversation and through a relationship to give her the best protection. She would tell us every Monday exactly what she was doing throughout that week and beyond. So we were able to put in place, you know, the right reconnaissance, etc., to make sure that nothing did go wrong. And I have to say that in all of my time in water protection, over 16 years, and certainly working with Diana, never once was that security compromised. But coming on to Meghan and Harry, I, he's only ever known that sort of security. Yeah. And, and I don't quite know what he's contemplating. I think he firmly believes that the protection will carry on as normal, but we know the, the public outcry. We hear this, 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 these tales from the taxpayer that are very reluctant to pay these exorbitant amounts of money. Mm. But I think a compromise has got to be reached here, and that's why I think that you know, the Queen and the, the Prince of Wales may well be totally unprecedented, willing to pay towards that protection. We're, time alone will have to tell that story. Mm. There's been some speculation about um, putting things into their residences like a panic room. Did, did Diana ever have anything, any such thing? <laughs> well, we, in every royal palace there is a, a, a safe room, obviously. I mean, that's been fairly well documented. But, I mean, that, that's nearly not an issue. I mean, you know, you can put that anywhere. Um, but um, the protection that was afforded to her and other members of the royal family, you know, it comes from this uh, unique uh, elite band of officers that, you know, are able, you know, with a, with a, with a bottomless pot of cash, get the best and receive the best training and and that that is that all is as a result of what happened you know in 1974 of the attack on princess anne because the yard realized then as indeed the british government that the protection afforded at that time mm. was nowhere near as efficient as it should have been and every year now there are constant reviews of, of incidents at buckingham palace and beyond that looks closely at that that uh, protection provided that's fascinating, and I think that this will rumble on, particularly as we sort of like learn how Harry and Meghan are going to make their money mm. and what they're going to spend it on. Clearly not protection. We'll be doing that. <laughs> but as we've heard, royal security is an expensive business, and we ask the public if they think taxpayers should foot the bill. No, I don't think so. Uh, no, we shouldn't, because 
they're doing their own thing now, so they should pay for their own security. No, I don't think we should because they've chose to go their own way and they should be paying their own way as well. I don't think so. I mean, it was their decision to leave, so why should we pick up what they've left? Uh, in a way, yeah. Uh, no, I don't know. I think they should. I think anything that Harry does or Meghan does for the country, then they should have security paid for by us. But otherwise, no, you know, they should pay for it themselves. Well, he's been riding high in the PR stakes recently, but Prince William found himself in the papers for the wrong reasons this week after he was caught joking about how he and his wife were spreading coronavirus. What else is anyone talking about on a state visit to Ireland? Well, hours later, his stepmother Camilla was also heard joking about going into self-isolation. Richard Eden, is this badly timed? Do you think it's tasteless? Um, perhaps a little, but isn't it great that we've oh, got some... Don't be a buzzkill. We've got candidates, we've got people fighting to <laughs> step into the shoes of Prince Philip since he's retired. <laughs> you know, we need the royals to keep making jokes. And, um, come on, everyone else is talking, sometimes joking about coronavirus. So, you know, when you meet a member of the royal family, you need someone to break the ice, put people at ease, and... Um, With a nice joke about a... An, an, a pandemic <laughs> about to sweep the globe. I remember when I met Prince <laughs> when I met Prince Philip once at Buckingham Palace, and it was all a, it was a bit awkward. And he said to me, "Oh, where do you work?" And at the time, I was at the Telegraph, and I said, "Oh, the Daily Telegraph." And he sort of stared at me and said, "Which department?" And I said, "Oh, the Social Diary, Social Diary." And he said, "Ah, the Fiction Department." <laughs> Might be true about the Telegraph, but uh, certainly not any any no. publication mm. at Mail Towers. Mm. Uh, Richard Kay, I mean. You know, they must run out of things to talk about with of, people, right? Of course they do. Yeah. Of course they do. I thought it was an entirely natural, reflective action by, by Prince William and indeed by Camilla. Mm. I, I thought um, coronavirus has been dominating the news. We're, we're on the verge of panic buying for things we don't need. Anything to sort of lighten the atmosphere and sort of put it into perspective, I think William helped. I'm always panic buying things I don't need. That's a, that's, I'm ahead of the game. But Ken, you must have heard the odd <laughs> off-colour joke. He's not a joke teller, William. <laughs> uh, and and ni neither is Camilla. But, who, who are the joke tellers in the royal family? Oh, there was quite a few of them. I mean, but some of the jokes that Diana told us are not fit for public airing. Oh, but, um, well, that's why we want to hear them. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, but, no, they, they have a sense of humour. Don't, yeah, don't, yeah. I don't say that. But I, I sat as to just remind of one. I remember when William and Harry were young that Diana had set up a, a go-karting uh, event down at Highgrove. And so this go-karting company delivered three go-karts. And William decided that he'd run down the back drive through his father's vegetable garden in front of the wild seabed in front of Highgrove. And that would be the, the circuit. We all agreed with it. Unfortunately, it rained heavily that night and it completely carved up his vegetable garden and his seabed. So two weeks later, I remember I was there and the Prince of Wales came in and he said, uh, I gather you've sort of had a marvellous day with, with women here with those go-karts. That's very good. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. And he said, you're not thinking of becoming the next Bernie Eccleston, are you? <laughs> <laughs> At least he made fun of it. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I have to say, but they're all my experiences, and, and Richard knows a lot of my anecdotes, that actually it was fun working with them, to be, to be quite frank. Um, and, uh, you know, despite all the unhappiness that both he and Diana had, I, I was surprised that through those turbulent years of the 80s, that all of us, including myself, certainly had some bloody good laughs. Did you ever have to, uh, uh, you know, we've all heard that Prince Philip has done some famous gaffes in his time. Did you ever have to apologise on behalf of anyone or did you ever <laughs> see anyone sort of feeling offended by some inadvertent ins insensitivity? Or? There, there were lots of insensitivities. Oh, man. Um, Come but, on. <laughs> but, 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 I mean, it, it, you know, I, I had the privilege of working with the Duke on a number of occasions. I mean, yeah. but as Richard pointed out, he, he, he was quick to speak his mind. And I don't think he, he ever went out of his way to offend people. You know, he actually treated people normally. I mean, I remember one particular occasion when some woman was persistent in getting a photograph of him, which he said, yes, you get on with it. And then he sent his daughter up to get him. Yeah, you get on with it. When she went back for the third shot, <laughs> could I get somebody to take a picture of me and my daughter? He said, back her off. You know, and that was it. But, yeah. you know, that's... I think people find that entertaining. <laughs> and so. It'd be yeah. a sad day yeah, when no, he's gone. I, I would agree. I mean, pr Prince Philip was, was brilliant. He provided um, a very useful foil for the Queen when he was doing royal engagements with the Queen. The Queen, despite her great experience, is actually quite a shy woman. And going into huge receptions with a vast number of people, with all their eyes fixed on you, must, be, must have been quite daunting for her at times. Philip was brilliant at breaking the ice, as Richard said. He was the icebreaker in chief. Mm. And if there's a way of easing the tension by telling a joke like William, like Camilla did, why not? What's the harm? Well, I mean, do you really think people will be offended 
by that kind of humour. The, the problem is that things have changed so much in society, haven't they? Since, oh, yes. you know, all, yeah. all the jokes of Prince Philip um, down the years, imagine them now with social media, you know, there's outrage at the, the slightest attempt at humour and it doesn't work very well online. So It's, it's always a better story, um, though, if you've been offended by a famous <laughs> person than if they were perfectly nice. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> they probably have to be a bit more careful than in the past. Hmm. Well, on that note, let's move on. Let's go back to the people now to ask the public if they think the royals should be more careful with their humour. Uh, yeah, they've got a they've got a reputation to hold, aren't they? So if they start if they're making jokes about that, they're probably not on really. Yes, I I do because I think you don't know who you're offending. No, I think the royals should be able to make a joke whenever they feel like it, like any other people. Yeah, I think they should, obviously, because they're in the public eye and uh, people look up to them, so it's important that they're like careful with what they say. Um, I think they need to be careful with everything they do because they're so public. Yes, I, well, I don't know. I think, every, you know, you've got to look at the context of the joke. The rules can joke about, you know, like, as Ricky Gervais says, you can joke about anything as long as it's, you know, as long as you, you know, it's in within, within the context. I think that's fine. Now, as we mentioned earlier, Meghan returned to British soil last night, but without her young son, Archie, he's been left behind, a move that has attracted some criticism. Richard Kay, the Queen left her kids at home all the time. Is this unusual? It's, it's not unusual. It's perfectly yeah. true that um, back in the 1950s, when Prince Charles and Princess Anne were very small, the Queen went on many round-the-world tours, and at one stage, I think she was away for several months um, and didn't see Charles. So... It is, it's not to be unexpected. Uh, everything changed, however, really with, um, with William and Harry when they were infants and yes. Charles and Diana wanted them to go with them on all their royal tours. And even as a one-year-old, William went to Australia on a fairly lengthy six-week trip with, with his parents. I remember when Harry was taken to Venice on the Royal Yacht Britannia with, with Diana. And so they were sort of part of the family scene and, and they were part of the group. Um, it's slightly different, I feel, for Harry and Meghan. I mean, they've, they've made their new home, their new base in, in, on the west coast of Canada. It's a long flight from there to London. Meghan will not be here very long. Yeah. Um, she will be hurrying back to him. And who knows? I mean, what, what, what young mum really wants to travel with a 10-month-old child? <laughs> not me. Uh, Richard, playing devil's advocate on this, Richard Eden, I'll come to you. But, you know, um, the Crown has got a lot of dramatic mileage about how mm. miserable the Queen's children were being left for so long. So this, this is not, not the most modern take on parenting for a woke royal, is it? I think it's very sad. I mean, mm. you know, uh, they, they pride themselves on being hands-on parents and everything, and it's no trouble to take Archie with them. I'm sure they've got a nanny who could help on the flight. Um, it would all be much easier than for regular parents in economy or whatever. Um, and also very sad for the family here that they won't see Archie. I mean, how many times have... Charles and Camilla seen Archie or, or the Queen. You mm. know, it's um, a real another missed opportunity. This is the second time they've been over and left him at home. And he's so cute. I'd love to see him. And he's it, so cute. It almost feels like a calculated snub, really. Oh dear. I don't think oh, it's gosh. a. I don't think it's a snub, but I do think it is setting down a marker for the way they're bringing up this child, and and it's about this boy's future. He's. They are saying he's not going to be part of the royal establishment. Mm. He doesn't have a title. He's going to live outside the gilded cage, if you like. And it fits in with that. Mm. I mean, back to protection for a minute, Ken. Does it make it easier to protect royals if they don't have their children? Well, I think in this case, I mean, you know, I, I take both Richard's points, but a bit the travelling, the nanny, the, the extra two seats in economy or the extra two seats in business, kind of whatever, just adds to the additional cost. And given the fact that Meghan's not going to be here that, that, that long anyway, and, and bringing a child of that age across, you know, the water, I'm not so concerned or for that may believe that the Queen or any other member of the British Royal will be sadly destroyed of not seeing Archie at this point. Um, you know, You've because, seen one baby. Well, <laughs> but it's not that. It's just that you know, we, we, we sort of try and liken it to um, you know, what, what a normal family expects. And, and, I, and I say this with no real heartache, that we're talking about a family that is quite unique, which is far from normal in that mm. sense. So I think the judgment was right in this particular case. Um, because there are additional security costs with bringing a baby of that age. As I said at the very beginning here, that um, one of the real issues with protection of any family, particularly this family, 
is, is going to be seriously the, the risk of, of kidnap with someone like Archie. Mm. Um, you know, I, for goodness sake, hope that doesn't ever happen. But this is why it is important to come back to this question of security, that, that the very best is afforded them at whatever cost. The rest you've heard from me. Well, you knew Harry when he was younger. Are you surprised at the move that he and Meghan have made to quit the royal family? Well, I, yes, I am surprised. If I, yes, I am surprised because I, I, I think that, you know, he as a, as a prince of the realm was was very much part of his father's modern package of royalty, mm -hmm. and so there was the three of them, and suddenly a third of, of that new package has disappeared. Um, my own view is that I thought he believed that he would be very much a bi big player in the future of the monarchy, but for reasons which we're not really aware of that he has decided and initially thought we could do six months here six months over there and everyone would, would buy that but the queen and his father really didn't buy that mm. and they're saying look you're either in or you're out and they're currently out so i don't quite know how this is going to play i think he'd be very disappointed and upset that, that he could have met them halfway which which clearly hasn't happened well yeah, there will be a fascinating twist next week won't there richard k when the families together for a Commonwealth event. How yeah. do you think that's going to play out? Yeah, well, that will be um, tricky, I think, <laughs> um, because they'll have the television cameras on them. It's, going, it's being televised. They'll all be sitting in, in various rows at Westminster Abbey for this fairly formal and sombre service. It's Every body language expert in the country will <laughs> yeah. have a payday Everyone. that week. <laughs> and, you know, and we'll yeah. all be glued to watching yeah. it. Um, the Queen, of course, will be scrupulous and not betray any kind of emotion either way. Um, yeah, I mean, it is, it is going to be fascinating to see them on parade like this, but particularly because we know it's potentially the last time, or at least the last time for some time. Mm. I'm sure we are going to see Harry um, this year on other occasions, but I wonder how much we're going to see of Meghan in the future. Mm. Richard mm. Eden, do you got any intel from behind the scenes? What, what do you think will be going on? in the oh, run-up to these plans. I mean, forget the West End. This is the best show in town. It really it? is. <laughs> yeah. All yeah. eyes will be on them. We saw Meghan last night, you know, looking 100% Hollywood, smiling at the cameras, looking fantastic. Um, what's she going to be wearing on Monday? And what's Kate going to be wearing? It's um, really one to watch. Yeah, I, I, am, I am actually, despite myself and hating myself, very excited to see what happens. But that is all we have time for today on Palace Confidential. I want to thank you for joining us and thank you to my panel, Richard, Richard and Ken. And we'll see you next time.